recording. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our uh, weekly seminar. Um, this week, we are hosting um, Dr. Anand Kuda in the Department of Environmental Science at the University of Southern Michigan. Hello. Good, thanks. And um, uh, Anand Kuda is currently a research associate at the Department of Environmental Science. Environmental Sciences at the University of Bayern. She has received her PhD in 2013 at the APA Institute in Germany, and was a postdoc at Princeton University in Germany in the Max Planck Institute in Mainz, Germany, before joining the University of London. Anya is a pilot climatologist and biogeochemist, and is interested in studying marine and she specialized in, um, in an analytical technique to measure the nitrogen of nitrogen in the dark matter first in the cell to describe the nitrogen of the ocean and later in the past. Today, Anya is going to talk about how can nitrogen is so Today, Anya is going to talk about how can nitrogen and Okay, hello everyone. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me. So do you now have the right screen of mine? Is that okay? Can you everyone see my presentation? Excellent. Excellent. Okay, perfect. So thank you, Nicholas, very much for the invitation. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to share you some of my research. Um, and I'm just gonna click away my video here. Okay, so as Nicholas said, my topic today is the nitrogen cycle in the ocean and in lakes and how we can use measurements of nitrogen isotopes in nitrogen fossils to reconstruct past environmental conditions. Um, why is it interesting to study the nitrogen cycle of the ocean and of lakes? So in the ocean, uh, bioavailable nitrogen controls uh, marine productivity and therefore uh, the capacity of the ocean to sequester CO2 in the interior. Um, on the other hand, in lakes, a large amount of bioavailable nitrogen can cause eutrophication, um, enhanced algal blooms and in turn oxygen loss. So it's important that we understand the nitrogen cycle of oceans and lakes today and in the past. And why in the past, um, already 200 years ago, David Hume realized that the past is the key to the future. So the better we understand environmental change in the past, the better uh, can we understand not only the present, but also uh, the better we can anticipate um, global change into the future and how the earth system might respond to that. Um, so today in my talk, I'll first um, focus on the nitrogen cycle of the ocean. And particularly we're looking at the Southern Ocean and how the nutrient status of the Southern Ocean um, is linked to atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Um, and I'll show you two case studies, uh, one from the last ice age and one from the Holocene uh, warm period. And in the second and uh, shorter part of my talk, I would like to look at the nitrogen cycle of lakes using the very same methodology, nitrogen isotope measurements in nitrogen fossils, and how we can use um, those to reconstruct uh, eutrophication in the recent So let's start with the nitrogen cycle in the ocean. Um, so one of the most intriguing questions in paleoclimate research is what causes cyclic variations between ice ages and warm periods um, over the last uh, millions of years. And you see here measurements that have been made on ice cores retrieved from Antarctica. And uh, we know that um, over the last 800,000 years, 
um, when, it would, when it was warm in Antarctica, um, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere were high. And when it was cold in Antarctica, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere were low. And now ultimately these changes between ice ages and warm periods are caused by uh, changes in the distribution of solar radiation that is received on Earth's surface. But there has to be a feedback mechanism internal to the climate system that amplifies these changes. And it is widely believed that CO2 is that feedback then which causes these cycles between warm periods and cold periods. Now the question is why does CO2 change between ice ages and warm periods? Where does the CO2 go when it's not in the atmosphere? Um, these are the different carbon reservoirs that exchange with the atmosphere. And the, the deep ocean is about 50 times larger than the atmosphere, and it exchanges on timescales of hundreds, hundreds to thousands of years, so relatively fast. And so it is widely accepted that during ice ages, the deep ocean takes up CO2, and during warm periods, the deep ocean releases CO2 back into the atmosphere. Now, the question is, what are the mechanisms by which the deep ocean and the atmosphere exchange CO2 on those timescales. Now, um, the Southern Ocean is the place where the deep ocean and the atmosphere connect. You see here a section through the Southern Ocean with Antarctica on the left-hand side. And you see that deep waters that are rich in nutrients and rich in CO2, they come to the surface. And CO2, natural derived CO2, is outgassing into the atmosphere. At the same time, you have ocean circulation, uh, which flows partly northwards to form intermediate waters, and a part flows southwards to form deep waters. And those intermediate and deep waters, they take up CO2 and they take up heat from global warming uh, and put it back into the ocean. So the Southern Ocean is really an important place um, where the deep ocean and the atmosphere connect and exchange CO2 through circulation. But it's not only the circulation which controls CO2, but it's also biology that is important. Um, in, the, in the surface ocean, you have phytoplankton that take up CO2 from the atmosphere and they take up nutrients, nitrate, phosphate, to make photosynthesis, to build their biomass. And um, a fraction of it is remineralized and a fraction of it uh, is reaching the sedimentary record. And um, this here is, is remineralized back to CO2. So this biological driven sequestration of CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean interior is what we call the ocean's biological pump. Now today, the biological pump is not really working as at its full capacity in the Southern Ocean. And you see this on this map here on the left, on the right up, sorry. And um, those red warm colors that you see, this is a map of surface nitrate concentrations. And those red colors imply that we have a lot of nutrients like nitrate left in the surface ocean on an annual basis. And which means that the biological pump is not working at its full capacity because the, the phytoplankton are not taking up all that nitrate. So it's a missed opportunity to store CO2 in the ocean interior. Now, the reason why they're not doing this is because they don't have enough light and they don't have enough iron, which they need to grow. So in other words, the biological pump um, is leaking CO2 to the atmosphere because it's not working at full capacity. And if we want to understand how efficiently the biological pump has been working in the past, um, we can reconstruct the surface nitrate concentrations of, uh, of the Southern Ocean, for example, to reconstruct the efficiency of the biological pump in the past, to understand how efficiently was the deep ocean taking up CO2. So how can we reconstruct surface nitrate concentrations in the past? This is where the nitrogen isotopes come into play. Nitrogen has two stable isotopes, 14N and 15N. 
And the lighter isotope 14 and uh, reacts preferentially, for example, in biological reactions. And so it's fractionating, meaning, uh, for example, when phytoplankton stimulate nitrates, they incorporate the lighter isotope preferentially into their biomass. Now, in the Southern Ocean, you have once per year, once per year mixing and replenishment of nutrients in the surface ocean um, in winter. And then during spring and summer, you have um, phytoplankton productivity. So they will start uh, to assimilate nitrates. So nitrate concentrations will start to decline. Or in other words, nitrate consumption will increase with time. And because the phytoplankton fractionates, they preferentially take up the lighter isotope, the isotopic composition, the delta N15 of the nitrate left behind, will increase. So nitrate concentrations decline and the delta 15 of the nitrate increases as a response. And not only of the nitrate in the water, but eventually the phytoplankton, the diatoms that grow, their biomass will record that isotopic signature. And it's actually not only their biomass which records the isotopic composition of the nitrate, but a tiny fraction of the biomass happens to end up in their shell, in their siliceous shell that is called frustule. And when the diatoms, when they die and sink um, to the sediment, that isotopic information of the nitrate in the surface ocean is stored in their shells. So we can measure the diatom bound delta N15 of a sedimentary record back in time to reconstruct the degree of nitrate consumption in the surface ocean. Now, the advantage of measuring the nitrogen isotope in those fossil shells is that um, it avoids problems uh, that arise when you measure bulk sediment delta N15, because in the past, that's what re researchers have been doing. Um, they, they just measure the bulk delta N15 of the sediment, but that can be biased by nitrogen input from land, from the continents, and it can be biased uh, by diagenetic alteration. Um, let me quickly admit some people in the waiting room. Okay. Um, so there's that by measuring the nitrogen isotopic composition of diatom shells avoids problems that are related to diagenetic alteration and external nitrogen input. And so the diatom bound delta 15, um, as I said, records the degree of nitrate consumption in the surface ocean, and it is related to biological productivity. So the nitrate uptake and export in the surface ocean, but it is also related to the nitrate supply from below. So it's a relative measure, um, productivity versus nitrate supply. And past productivity, that's also something we can measure in a sedimentary record. So the only, um, what we cannot measure, the only unknown variable here is nitrate supply. So we can basically rewrite that equation and solve for nitrate supply, which is nothing else than the overturning circulation in the Southern Ocean. So a few words to the method. How do we measure diatom-bound nitrogen isotopes? So as I said, we start off with a sedimentary record. This can come from the ocean. This can come from lakes. Um, from that sediment, uh, we sample that in regular intervals and then we separate the diatom opal out of the sediment. And we do, that, we do that by removing clays, by removing carbonates, and most importantly, we make a heavy liquid density separation uh, because diatom opal is lighter than um, most lithogenic material. We then chemically clean the opal to remove anything that sticks to the surfaces of the diatom opal. And now, so we really want to measure that organic nitrogen that is trapped in their shells, so in the silica structure of their shells. And to do that, we need to dissolve the opal. And at the same time, as we dissolve the opal and we liberate that organic nitrogen, 
we convert it to nitrate, to an aqueous sample. And the reason we do that is because in a following step, we convert the nitrate to nitrous oxide by denitrifying bacteria. And the reason we want nitrous oxide is because it's a gas that we can easily measure uh, on a mass spectrometer for its isotopic composition. So it's really just a two-step process in order to measure the organic nitrogen of those diatom shells. And with that method, we can measure uh, three milligrams of clean diatom oco, uh, per sample. So let's come to our case study. So uh, at the beginning, we're going to look at the case study uh, that covers the last ice age. Uh, roughly 20 to 70,000 years ago. And after that, we're going to look at the current warm period, which is the Holocene period. So I, I told you before that today, uh, the biological pump in the Southern Ocean is not, uh, is not working very efficiently and we are losing CO2 to the atmosphere today. Uh, but we know that during the last ice age, uh, the deep ocean was holding, was storing more CO2 in the ocean interior. And different hypotheses have been proposed uh, by what mechanism uh, the deep ocean was storing more CO2 in the interior. And among other hypotheses, um, two prominent ones are that uh, number one, past biological productivity was higher, which would uh, mean that phytoplankton were fixing more CO2 in the interior, or that the supply of nutrient and CO2 charged waters to the surface was lower. So less CO2 outgassing, um, that it would mean less CO2 outgassing, but it would also mean that because less nutrients come to the surface, those few nutrients that would make it to the surface would be more completely consumed, which means a more efficient uh, biological pump. And um, past, so greater productivity, number one, um, was suggested due to um, a greater input of iron bearing dust um, because that would relieve um, the phytoplankton from iron limitation that they're facing today. So we're, we're trying to test these hypotheses by measuring um, diatom bound delta 15 and past productivity um, in different sediment cores from the Southern Ocean, from the Antarctic zone of the Southern Ocean and basically to reconstruct nutrient supply. And we have two uh, sediment cores from the Indian Ocean, one from the Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean. And um, let's start with the data from the Pacific. So we retrieved a sediment core um, that covers here 20, 220,000 years. Um, so it actually covers the last two ice ages that are highlighted in blue. And on top, you see the atmospheric CO2 curve as a reference. Now in the middle panel in green um, are plotted the nitrogen isotopes as measured on the diatom uh, bound organic matter. And the axis is reversed such that higher delta 15, more complete nitrate consumption is pointing downward. And on the bottom, we have two different measures for past productivity. In pink is uh, the opal flux, so diatom productivity. And in purple is shown um, the barium iron ratio of the sediment. This was determined by XRF scanning. And it's a measure for productivity because barium, so barite crystals form when um, organic matter decays. And so it's directly linked to productivity. And the, the normalization to iron is basically to correct for the lithogenic input of barium to the sediment. So what do we see um, um, on these data? So we see that during the last two ice ages, uh, nitrate consumption, delta 15, was higher. So we had more complete uptake of nitrate in the surface ocean. At the same time, we had lower biological productivity in the Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean. So nitrate uptake and export was lower, nitrate consumption was higher. So if this goes down, this goes up, this means nitrate supply to the surface ocean must have decreased during the last two ice ages in the Southern Ocean, in the Pacific sector of the Southern Ocean, which means we had 
uh, reduced Southern Ocean overturning and the more efficient uptake of CO2 uh, uh, by biology. So more complete, more efficient biological pump. So when we go back to our hypothesis, so it did not have uh, enhanced productivity, but we had a reduced supply um, of nutrients and, and CO2 charged deep waters uh, to the surface. A more efficient biological pump. Now, we did these measurements into um, other uh, sediment cores from the Indian Ocean that are shown here. And um, these data are shown in pink and in purple. So on the top, you see, uh, again, this is Antarctic temperatures and CO2 as measured on the ice cores. And the green curve is the same as before from the Pacific. And you see in pink and in purple, the data from the Indian Ocean. And these are very high resolution data. There's a lot of nuances to, to these data that I'm not going into detail. But again, the big picture that we see from these data is that during the last two ice ages, nitrate consumption was much more complete in the Southern Ocean, in different sectors of the Southern Ocean, so in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean. And on the very bottom, you see another measurement that has been made by, by a colleague of mine. And it's also, it's a nitrogen isotope measurement, but uh, made on corals. So it's basically the same proxy. So it's because corals feed, so these are deep sea corals that are, have been retrieved from the Drake's Passage, shown here by the triangle. And those corals, they feed on particles that rain down from the surface ocean. And again, the organic matter of that in the coral skeleton will record the degree of nitrate consumption in the surface ocean. So it's the same principle. And also these data show a more complete uptake of nitrate um, in that part of the Southern Ocean. So it's a very, a very complete picture that we have. It's the most comprehensive data set that we have of a nitrate depleted Southern Ocean during the last ice age, uh, which means we had a more efficient biological pump and more deep ocean CO2 storage by um, having uh, less nutrients that reach the surface, but more complete uptake of those nutrients. So that was um, the case study from um, the last ice age or the last two ice ages. Now, um, we did uh, a couple of years ago, another study in the Holocene, um, which is roughly the last 11,000 years of, uh, of Earth's history. Now, uh, the Holocene is an interesting time period because um, it used to be called a climatically stable period. Um, if you look at Antarctic temperatures, shown here in blue, they don't change much over the last 8,000 years. So they're quite stable. But actually, um, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, they increase by 20 ppm. That's a lot, given that the glacial interglacial range is about 100 ppm. So we have a huge rise in atmospheric CO2 that has long been a mystery as to why that is. And it's especially intriguing because a compilation of temperature records from both uh, the marine side, so in the, in the oceans, different proxies that have been measured to reconstruct temperature in the ocean, but also on land, um, they show actually a decline in temperature over the Holocene. So these are more than 70 temperature records that have been combined. And this is interesting because climate models, they hint cast a warming uh, across that period which is mostly driven by the, the greenhouse gas forcing. Um, but global temperature records seem to suggest a cooling. So that has been um, called the Holocene temperature conundrum, that's the data model mismatch. And again, the, the, the rise in CO2 concentration has long been a mystery. And the hypotheses that have been proposed um, included a decline in the terrestrial biosphere, due to global cooling and drying, meaning less trees on land that take up less CO2. Another hypothesis uh, was proposed by Ruddyman. It's a similar hypothesis, but he suggested that humans are responsible for the CO2 rise because they cut down the forests. And again, less trees on land take up less CO2. Other hypotheses that have been proposed are um, marine hypotheses. So mainly the, um, 
the position of, of carbonate. So both shallow water carbonate platforms, but also um, deep carbonate uh, formation. Because if you form carbonate, you pull uh, the equation uh, to the pink side. And in the process, you, you generate CO2 that is then outgassed to the atmosphere. Now we have been proposed, we have proposed another hypothesis, which is that the Southern Ocean overturning accelerated over the Holocene time period and released CO2 through that mechanism through the weakening of the biological pump. And I'm gonna show you how um, we reconstructed that. So from a series of sediment cores uh, from the Southern Ocean, again, we've measured nitrogen isotopes and past productivity um, by measuring the item bound delta 15. And we compared this data with measurements of coral bound delta 15, what I've shown you before, from corals from the Drake Passage and from south of Tasmania. And we have also a record from foraminifera bound delta 15 from the Atlantic. Again, it's the same principle for foraminifera. Um, or they also build some organic matter into their calcite shells. And again, it's related to the degree of nitrate consumption in the surface ocean uh, in, in that region. So you see here um, on the right side, again, the CO2 curve as a reference over the last 10,000 years. And our nitrogen isotope data um, are the following. So in green, we have diatom bound delta 15, in blue, we have data from the corals. And in pink, we have the data from the foraminifera bounds, delta 15. And all seven records show a declining nitrate consumption. So decreasing delta 15 over the Holocene period, meaning nitrate was less completely consumed across the entire Southern Ocean. Now for the productivity, so on the records that we have measured diet and bound delta 15, we have a productivity data. And in two records, we see increasing productivity and in one record, um, productivity is stable. So again, if we put this into our equation here, so we have um, increasing uptake and export or maybe constant, and we have a decline in the nitrate consumption as shown by delta 15 data, which means this goes up, this goes down, means nitrate supply to the Southern Ocean surface must have increased over the Holocene period. In other words, the Southern Ocean accelerated uh, overturning, which implies um, that the Southern Ocean was losing a CO2 to the atmosphere by bringing up more CO2 charged deep waters that then outgas and biology was just not able to take up, uh, um, again, that CO2 and the nutrients from the surface ocean. So a less efficient biological pump and outgassing of CO2 to the atmosphere. And we hypothesize that this probably can explain or at least contribute to the 20 ppm rise um, that we see of atmospheric CO2 over the Holocene period. So that was, um, basically the nitrogen cycle in the ocean um, that I wanted to show you. And I, now I would like to show you a case study that I've been working on recently, um, which is in lakes. And the idea was that we take the very same proxy um, and bring it to lake sediments. So by <clears throat> taking diatom bound nitrogen isotope measurements, and we wanted to see, can we use it um, to get some information about the nitrogen cycle in lakes. Can it tell us some, something about nitrogen input or output processes or internal nitrogen cycle processes within lakes? Maybe um, can it tell us something about the recent eutrophication history of some of uh, the lakes that we have here in, in Switzerland in the recent past? And we chose a Lake Lugano as a a case study. So it's a lake in southern Switzerland. And as many other Swiss lakes, it has undergone severe eutrophication between the 1960s and the 1980s, roughly. And you see this on this figure that shows the phosphorus concentrations in the lake. So they really peaked 
uh, beginning uh, 60s and then only declined uh, slowly afterwards. So this was because a lake restoration program was put forward. Um, wastewater treatment plants have been built. And in 1986, phosphorus was banned from detergents in Switzerland. And the goal of the restoration program was really to limit nitrogen and phosphorus in the lake in order to uh, limit primary productivity, but also to improve the oxygenation of the lake at depth because um, Lake Lugano is today seasonally anoxic. And the goal was really to bring the lake back to conditions prior to human impact. So, and also the sedimentary record uh, can provide information on that end. So the goal of this study was really twofold. It was once testing this proxy that we have been applying to ocean sediments for two decades almost. So taking this proxy to lake sediments and try to understand, can it tell us something about nitrogen cycling in lakes? And then number two, um, we wanted to see, can it tell us about something about the recent paleoenvironmental conditions of that lake over the last 100, 150 years? And so you see here a sketch um, simplified uh, nitrogen cycle in the lake. So we have different input processes um, that brings that bring nitrogen into the lake, into the lake, which are end fixation. Um, we have input from rivers, runoff from land uh, that brings nitrogen into the lake. We have deposition from the atmosphere, and we have um, fertilizers that come in. We have manure, we have household sewage, all that brings uh, nitrogen into the lake. In the lake, we have um, a simulation of nitrogen by phytoplankton, uh, a fraction of which reaches the sedimentary record, and uh, the large part is recycled within the lake. And the main output processes of nitrogen in lakes are denitrification. So that happens both in the water column and in the sediment. And in that process, nitrate is converted to nitrous oxide and then to gas. And since these are gases, they, they're, they're lost from the system. And especially water column denitrification leads to a huge isotope fractionation, um, which leaves the heavy N15 behind in the lake. And so we have retrieved a sediment core that is shown here on the top. It's about um, 70 centimeters long. And you see already um, in the core photograph that there are some turbidites in the sediment core and they're highlighted by this light brown color. It's just that you see that there's a difference between the background sediment and, and the, the regular sedimentation. Um, the core has been dated by lead 210 and cesium 137. And I show here the data against core depth, but I indicate the two dates that we have from the cesium dating, which is the 1963 um, bomb testing peak, and on the other hand, the 1986 Chernobyl accident. Um, so these are two important time markers because they constrain the eutrophication period um, really well. And so what do we see here? Um, uh, what data do we see here? So on the bottom, we have again a measure uh, for past productivity. This is again, it's the barium to titanium ratio, um, similar as we've seen in, in the ocean sediment. So it's a measure for past productivity. And in green, we have the nitrogen isotope data. We've also measured bulk delta 15, but I'm gonna focus here on the Dighton bound delta 15 data, which is the dark green. So we see that right at the beginning of the eutrophication period, right at the beginning of the 60s, we have an increase in past productivity in Lake Lugano. And at the same time, the Delta 15 increases as well. And right after mid eighties, when phosphorus was banned from the detergents in Switzerland, we have a decline in productivity, um, which is probably uh, due to the re-oligotrophication of the system. And we also have a decline in Delta 15. So the productivity data make, makes perfect sense. So as um, the lake uh, goes into eutrophication, we have more nutrients around 
uh, more phytoplankton production. And, and we see this in the sedimentary record. The question is why does the delta N15 increase over the time of eutroph eutrophication? And to understand that, we go to our sketch, to our um, a lake and cycle sketch. So there are three possibilities how the delta N15 of the nitrate in the water can increase. And one possibility is that we have enhanced water colony nitrification. So I said to you before that in this process, nitrate is lost from the system and it's heavily fractionated, meaning um, the light 14N is lost and the heavy N15 stays behind. So there's a huge isotope effect associated with that process. Another possibility to have a higher delta 15 in the lake is that the input processes um, are responsible, but most inpro input and input processes, they have a, a low delta 15 signature. And the only one that maybe could re be responsible is a higher input of manure because this is enriched in N15. A third possibility is that we had more complete consumption of nitrate. As I told you before, in the oceans, um, the more completely nitrate is taken up, the higher the isotopic composition of the nitrate. So also this process would lead to an increase in the delta 15, which is what we eventually measure uh, with our Dighton bound at delta 15 record. Now, in order to um, differentiate among these different processes, we measured an additional parameter. And uh, what we measured is a biomarker for N2 fixation. So cyanobacteria, they, they can fix N2. Um, it's, it's actually a special cells that the cyanobacteria form, um, which are called heterocysts. And those heterocysts, they fix N2. And those heterocyst cells, they build an additional cell wall to protect themselves from oxygen. And that cell wall is made out of glycolipids. So what we can measure in the sedimentary record is the concentration of heterocyst glycolipids. And this is a biomarker for N2 fixation by cyanobacteria. And you see the data here shown on top, and you will realize that they beautifully correlate with both the productivity data and with the dietin bound delta 15 data. So all three proxy variables, they increase over the eutrophication period. And even they show slight peaks here that are highlighted in orange. And so there's a beautiful correlation among all these three proxy rec records. And I'm going to argue in the following that the N2 fixation is actually a response to enhanced water column denitrification in Lake Lugano. And my argumentation is the following. So we know that between the 60s and the 80s, we had enhanced eutrophication in Lake Lugano. Eutrophication means we have an increase in productivity. And more productivity also means more remineralization of organic matter, which consumes oxygen. So we likely had anoxic conditions in the lake during that period. Now under anoxic conditions, we have water column denitrification. So loss of nitrogen from the system, which leaves the nitrate left behind heavily enriched, which is what we see in our Delta 15 data. At the same time, um, under anoxic conditions, Phosphorus from the sediment is remobilized um, into the water column. So in our water column, we have an increase of phosphorus and a decrease of nitrogen. So a decreasing entropy ratio. Now, if the entropy ratio drops below a certain threshold, 16 to 1, this stimulates into fixation. So our three proxy records, productivity data, the N15 data, and the N2 fixation data suggest that N2 fixation was a response to enhanced water column denitrification. And which means that our 
Titan bound Delta N15 proxy in Lake Lugano um, is actually um, indicating um, over the eutrophication period enhanced water column denitrification. So I hope I could show you that this is an exciting proxy um, that we can not only apply to ocean sediments, but also to lake sediments. And um, let me summarize my talk. So at the beginning, we have seen that we can reconstruct past nitrate consumption in the Southern Ocean by measuring diets and bounds, uh, delta N15 in ocean sediments. And we reconstructed the efficiency of the biological pump in the past and reconstructed the nutrient supply. So the overturning circulation in the Southern Ocean. And we have seen that during warm periods, such as the Holocene, um, nitrate consumption in the Southern Ocean is less complete and productivity is higher, which means we have an acceleration of Southern Ocean overturning, which means a release of CO2 to the atmosphere, which could probably explain the 20 ppm rise that we see in atmospheric CO2. We've also seen that during cold periods, so during the last two ice ages, we had more complete nitrate consumption across the entire Southern Ocean and lower productivity uh, in the Antarctic zone of the Southern Ocean, which means we have reduced uh, overturning in, in Southern Ocean, less uh, supply of nutrients to the surface ocean, and as a consequence, a more efficient biological pump and ocean CO2 uptake. And we have seen from our lake um, case study that um, we have now a proxy that we can not only use um, in the ocean to study the nitrogen cycle of the ocean, but also of lakes. And this was a really important um, pilot study to do because now the goal is that we go to longer um, records from lakes to, to go to really um, longer time scales, for example, from ICDP cores to reconstruct, uh, for example, terrestrial um, low latitude paleoclimates um, on much, much longer time scales. So I'm gonna stop here and I thank my collaborators and, and funding agencies and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, Anya. It was really, um, um, really a key point for us in my initial subject. Um, subject. I, I leave the podium for questions for the public before I have, I have two questions. So I leave the podium for questions. Go ahead, everybody. I don't bite. I can start. I'm not a student, uh, at least not uh, a young student, but we are uh, always studying something. <laughs> I want to ask a sort of an exotic question. Uh, I noticed that when you looked at the, when you showed coral corals, you took the desmophilium as a as an example. Um, why the desmophilium, or was it just in, uh, unintentional? Um, so I now I go back to the slide. So the so it's right. It was made on a desmophilum. Now this these are not data that I made myself. So it's a colleague of mine that is expert on corals. Um, so I I can't really answer your questions. I've no. I know that they have done a ground truthing study and they looked at different corals. So not only deep sea corals, but also um, shallow water um, corals. Why would you go for the deep sea corals? That's what I was missing maybe. Um, I guess in, this, in the Southern Ocean, that's what you get. I guess that's my, um, that would be my- no, You only get cold water, deep sea corals. You don't get uh, the shallow corals. Yeah, exactly. So in the Southern Ocean, really, I mean, also the Drake Passage, you have those, you know, they're, they're, that's, that's, what, that's what you get. Um, it, it samples the deep water, uh, the deep water, uh, water uh, mass rather than the shallow productive water mass. The thing is, so, I mean, it sits really deep, but it is still the assumption is that the corals that they feed on the particles that rain down from the from the surface ocean, 
Um, so they still should record productivity or nitrate consumption in the surface. Now it's also the place in the Drake Passage is you have, I mean, you have huge flow speeds and probably they integrate also over a large area because it, it gets narrower. So maybe you actually, um, you look at those corals which come from this place, but maybe they record actually an area over a little bit um, bigger area upstream, right? So they, they basically feed on everything that rains down, but still they record surface uh, conditions in terms of their nitrogen isotope signature. So they are integrators. Yes, I think they integrate, exactly. That's the right word. They integrate over maybe a, a bigger area upstream, um, not just the exact location where they're sitting. Thank you. I forgot to say that uh, it was a, a great talk. Uh, I mean, for me, I'm a geophysicist. It was completely eye-opening to the possibilities and to the applications. Thank you. Great. Good to hear that it was accessible to a wide audience. Thank you, Somebody else has a question? Mm, well, I will go with mine. Um, well, I just, I kind of know the answer, but I want you to tell the students why. Um, basically, why the southern ocean? I don't remember that you actually say that, but I'm not too sure. So the Southern Ocean, I mean, it's important really, uh, so for the, for the ocean, uh, obviously for the ocean part. So it's really the place where we have the connection with the deep ocean and the atmosphere. I've also done some studies in the North Pacific, um, but it's not as important for the ventilation of the deep ocean, right? I mean, at the end, this proxy in the ocean is really limited to the poles because that's where we have diatoms. So maybe in upwelling regions, so maybe um, in Namibia, uh, the coast of Africa, we have some diatoms, but really the Southern Ocean at the North Pacific is where, where they grow. Uh, and the Southern Ocean is just important for the CO2 uptake where really we have the formation of those deep waters, um, which would then fill the, the most part of the ocean basin. So it's really critical um, for CO2 storage. Okay, um, I, 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 I knew that, but I was thinking it was for the students. Yeah. Thank you. And I have a comment um, for slide 24, where you show the core of Lake Lugano. Um, when you show the core over there, you have the um, basis of the core and you have two turbidites, I think, right? Yeah, I have a number of turbidites. I mean, I have, oops, I have um, a large turbidite at the beginning and then I have some smaller turbidites uh, down the sequence, yes. I saw also that this is a paper interpretation. So I say this pulls it myself with the basin with the Layers 210, um, in the technique of dating. Not because basically what happened that also in the lake that I was working, which is in Norway, uh, also we have some fluoridites. And I did the less detail in Geneva, I don't know where you did it, but um, we had a lot of discussions considering the less detail. Because basically there is some kind of decision toward the coarse uh, sediment in the turbidite. And then basically there is some kind of a movement that the tip it doesn't fall in the right position, say by the way. This was in the lake I was working. So basically what I learned that this turbidite can probably make some problem, depending obviously, in the diffusion of the uh, element. Maybe this is something that I don't know if it's took into consideration uh, that this small turbidite over there may have some impact. I don't know, just to check for you. I don't know. This is a good comment. So we have done the, um, the dating at Eavag in, in Zurich by Nat Nathalie Dubois. Um, so it's, it's not, I haven't done this myself, but basically we didn't measure the turbidites. So we we basically skipped the turbidites 
um, for the led to 10 dating and because also you have then these huge accumulations um, that you have to, to calculate out of your sedimentation rates. Um, so right now, that's why I'm also showing the data versus depth and I have the two cesium H pointers inside. But yeah, I, this is still something that I have to work out in detail, the exact H model based on the let you 10 and also which, which model we're going to use. Yeah. Um, but it's a good, it's a good comment because I know that this can be complicated. It's not what, what, what we face is because we have the let you 10, the polonium, and the cesium, not the of them apparently But one of them was inside, I mean, in specific depth, but the other one was higher. So let's say polonium was lower, I don't know exactly, but lead was higher. So mm -hmm. this frequency caused a lot of discussions around the age, which actually was not the subject of the paper anyway, but it was it was leading to uh, misinterpretation of the correct age of the core, basically. So eventually, I mean, it's just a comment for you to um, No, it's... It's good to, because it's something I still have to, to work on on the H model. So it's good to take this into consideration. Okay, thanks. Okay. So I, I will give somebody else who has a question and the abilities in class. Anything else? None. Okay. Um, nobody else? Nobody else. Well, well thank you very much, Tanya. It was a pleasure. And again, uh, we will be extremely happy to host you <laughs> when uh, we finish with all these barriers of COVID. Mm -hmm. and, um, it will be fantastic. And uh, and I wonder if you would like to stay in touch with us for the next uh, seminar. We are going to have an exchange that I share with you to complete and give it. Maybe you will find something interesting that you would like to join. Sure. So if you will come with the, if the same thing back. Great. Okay. Good to know. Thanks very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for being with us virtually. And have a good uh, rest of the day. Yeah. You too. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.